Hi guys, Grapplers Academy back here with another video talking about how you can maximise all of your training partners on the mats. Yeah, we go through various different things that uh, can help you essentially speed up your progression. Also how to handle those training partners that might not maybe match your intensity, but also how to match your training partner's intensity as well and have that sort of same level of respect for everybody on the mat. And we've got a couple of pointers as well on how to help and accelerate your learning, whether you're a brand new white belt, whether you've been training for three to four years, or whether you'd be on that journey closer to white belt. First week of, let's, let's go first month of training for anybody. They are very, very stiff. They've got that 100 mile an hour mindset of where they, where they can't stop, they can't slow down, um, whether it's ego, pride, or just not knowing. Mm. Um, and sort of as, a, as an experienced player, like you kind of got to look at it as it's your responsibility to coach them into that sort of relaxing, relaxed mindset and relaxed sort of positioning of their bodies, haven't you, really? Yeah. Yeah, I think when you look at it from a beginner's point of view, when they're coming into the gym on that first day or the or the first couple of weeks or whatever, it's quite a daunting task, isn't it? Trying to pick apart the the difference between those lower lower training belts, and then you know you, you might be looking at blue or purple belts and thinking, you know, how, how are you going to get to that skill level, or are you even going to be able to utilise them as a training partner? And yeah, that might, that might be a good thing to just kick off and start talking about. Um, yeah. So yeah, like, because I think for me, like we touched on it last on the last episode with um, tips for beginners, but let's um, we'll give a few. I'm um, like personal tips that I've got for experienced players training with beginners is, especially if they're in their first, I'd probably say three months of training. Bring their intensity down. So like don't rise to their intensity sort of almost try and slow them down and teach them how to breathe teach them how to stay calm um speak to them after the role speak to them during the role um try to test their balance as opposed to their submission and positional um defense Offset them, use it as a chance to test your um, off-centering abilities as well. So if someone's coming in like a ball, use that to try and offset them and try and get them off balance so they have to catch themselves and play a little bit unorthodox. And I think the more that you relax as, a, as an experienced player, the the idea is the more that they'll see that and try to reciprocate it. And then if they don't have a, just speak to them afterwards because I don't know about yourself, but I've, I almost forgot what it's like to not relax during a role. Um, and how not to be that charging head first and then grab and clamp and then go until your arms are cramping and going, I can't open up now. I'm, I've got no energy. You can kind of almost peg yourself into a corner with it a little bit, can't you? And yeah. I think the difficulty for new people starting is bringing that ego and intensity onto the mat, especially for blokes. Mm. Um, like I, I think a lot of people turn up to jiu-jitsu because it's a martial art and there is that combative element of it, think, feeling like it's a fight. Um, yeah. And I know the comparison has been made a million times, but you, you got to look at it more like a conversation or, you know, so is, so is striking sports. And when you meet somebody new for the first time, and this applies even if you go into a different gym to get some training in, like if I was coming in to have a conversation with you, would I just start that conversation by shouting in your face and like shouting my opinion at you or something like that? No, like you come in and say, hello, you'd introduce yourself. And I kind of feel like a role with a new person is kind of like that and that is something that beginners kind of should put into place as well like you know you, you introduce yourself to the person you kind of work your way into the conversation slowly and then if the 
intensity ramps up over the course of the round, then that's fine. But it's a controlled intensity as it would be a naturally controlled progression of a conversation or something like that as well. Yeah. And just have a bit more fun with it. The, the amount of times that I've had to tell somebody to relax as, as a beginner and that, that can apply to the first 12 months for, for some people, can't it? It's yeah. just getting them to bring that intensity down and just breathe and think about what they're doing. Mm. People get themselves so worked up in a frenzy and the breathing shuts down and they can't even think about what they're doing, even if the position that you're putting them in is something that they've done in, in the class. Like you've put yeah. them there in that position with a purpose for them to work out what they've just done in the class in a live environment and they can't even think because the, the brain's not working. No, definitely. I think like the key word there that I expect you touched on is fun. Like the first 12 to 18 months should be more oriented around fun. Um, like having it as a place where you can switch off and enjoy yourself. Like there's not saying that you can't have that intensity with the rolling and the sparring side of things, but still try to have the element of I'm here to learn something new and I'm here to enjoy it. Um, and with that, there should be an element of relaxing and not trying to tense up and maintain this really tight, tense posture. It's, yeah, so just sort of coming in there and having fun. And then I think for the more experienced players who are partnered with them or they end up having a round with them or something, don't be shy to, as long as the instructions that you're given are correct and you know the subject inside out, don't be shy to encourage them to do certain things or coach them through and give up positions and give that person who's a little bit greener to the mat, give them the little wins that's going to help them see how the whole game ties together nicely. So I think yeah. uh, that's something that a lot of people forget as well. The more they progress is you don't have to win every round. You just have to take lessons away from each round. I think you can even go a bit further with that as well and just said that like getting a submission on somebody isn't the only way that you can win in a round. Yeah. Like if you can take the opportunity for somebody to get you in a, a worse off position and even the win for that round might just be you regarding. Like mm. your whole purpose of that round is just to regard and you know, let somebody progressively get you into side control or take you back or whatever. And then your win for that round is get to a neutral position and stay safe. And at the same time as that, they get to win as well. Because yeah. whether it's somewhat artificial or not, they're getting to work through that series of techniques and kind of figure out a pathway for them to get to a side control or back or mount or something like that. And then also coming up against the problem of somebody legitimately going through an escape. And I think one thing that's massively important as well for beginners is like to see more experienced people doing the technique and feeling it, not just in drilling. Because if it's relaxed and controlled and they can kind of switch on and think about what they're doing as well, seeing what you're doing, where you're framing, feeling what the pressure feels like, where the pressure is. And it's all that invisible aspect of jujitsu that you don't necessarily get just from drilling alone. Um, that I think is massively important and probably the most important thing that you learn in that first 12 months of jujitsu, really. Yeah. No, oh, definitely. Um... <clears throat> And I think, like you said, like going back to using the more experienced players and allowing them to sort of be in the bad positions and escaping, it sort of reinforces to the new beginner, oh, this stuff does work. And if, like, if they ask questions, you can either, there's two ways to address the questions when you get asked them in a round. Like, and I, I tend to have this approach with it as well, where if they're like, new new so more like six months in the training i will stop the round and i will talk them through it and i'll coach them through certain aspects of things but then if it's after six months where they're quite familiar with everything and they're, they're proficient enough in in what they're doing to ha give you a role and pick up things from from within the role then i'll spend time after the round um going through the questions or maybe i'll sort of get myself in a position where it answers their question during the role. Mm. So if they're sort of like, oh, how, like, 
they say if they sort of go, I can't pass your guard, then I'll position my body to almost feed them a guard pass, but they've still got to work for it. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think it's important for the for the newer player to get rounds in with the experienced player to just sort of learn how to be during a high intensity situation, really. Yeah, definitely. I, th- I think as well, like people are at jiu-jitsu training for different reasons. You've got the, the guy that's, you know, purple, brown belt, blue belt, whatever, trying to be there and compete because they're, they're training hard because they want to compete. And and maybe as a complete new guy, like you don't really get the opportunity to roll with them. Uh, and maybe just because they need to get the best out of their training, that might not be the best option for them at that time either. So kind of almost respect that a little bit as well. But then also these are the people that are there as more of the enthusiast. They still might train as much through the week, but it's a little bit more of a relaxed training environment. And, you know, not to forget as well that when you're turning up to you know, you make a commitment to train at a club, you, you're going to make friends. You're there to make friends and have a bit more of a relaxed, playful aspect to the sport as well. So approaching it like that, you might, you might go in the gym and there might be 20, 30 people in there and everyone's in there for a slightly different reason. And it might be different for the reason that you're there. But kind of reading the room and knowing who's there for what is, is an important distinction to make at the beginning as well. And I, and I think that kind of ties into another subject as well, which is quite important to utilise in different training partners. And that's kind of like the, the attitude that's been bred in the gym in general. If these like all the upper belts are just destroying all the, the lower belts, the white and the blue belts, and like every time that they roll, it's just tap, 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 as many taps as they can get in the round. Then those white and blue belts or people just coming in um, from fresh from the beginning are looking at it like, oh, this is what jujitsu is like. Jiu-Jitsu is just, I've got to try and smash my opponent as much as possible throughout the round. Whereas if it's a little bit more of a coached environment and it's there is like everyone's here to learn and I'm going to try and help you as much as you can help me and you're getting the most out of everybody, then as they're coming up, you get a different understanding of what the sport is. Mm. And it's it, it benefits both ways. Like you can learn off a brand new person, something that you would never come across against somebody who's been training for 12 months because yeah. they're not thinking in that jiu-jitsu mindset. But that might be something that's super valuable that you yeah. can carry across that you've never even thought about. No, I definitely agree. I definitely agree with that. Um, especially because, like, I don't know about yourself, but, like, there's a big block of uh, my training career where I wasn't really looking for those YouTube tutorials, but I remember at the very start of my training – every tutorial that I was finding, I was trying to sort of emulate it in training. And I was asking the more experienced belts, sort of like, I've seen this, is it good? And is it applicable? Um, and I think the, the response from the person that you're asking will kind of dictate what kind of upper belt you're going to be. Because it's kind of like, paying back through the experience that you've received because um like you said going back to sort of how it's sort of the energy at the club if those upper belts are just smashing and smashing and smashing then those that are coming through if they survive that long because they might get to a point where they're like this isn't for me they're going to do the exact same thing to those that are coming through and it's it might work for some, but for the, I'd argue for the greater good of training partners, I don't think it's the best way to coach the newer people coming through as you want your future training partners to be as open to advice as you like to, as like say I like to think I am. Um, but like, where was I going with that? My brain is just that disappeared then. Um, but yeah, I think I'd like like and I'd like the the those new people to sort of be ready to advise the newer people coming through when they get to that position of being able to offer that offer out advice. And it sort of goes in like the revolving circle, and you're more likely to get more and better training partners in the future through that nurturing process as opposed to essentially a survival of the fittest uh, mindset with it 
Yeah, it's kind of almost like running running the gauntlet at some gyms, isn't it? It's like a really high burnout rate. And, I, and actually, there's probably nothing wrong with that for certain gyms, um, mm. you know, d- depending on what the style of the gym is or maybe even whether it's more of an MMA-orientated gym. Like, yeah. you've kind of got to have breed a little bit more of that attitude or intensity. But I think even those gyms, even though that might be the, the way things are initially, like, as players get more experience and get older, it it might be a shift back towards what we're talking about. So that more humble, um, relaxed, calm approach to training where you can get more out of everybody. And you might kind of have to go through that um, trial by fire period for a couple of years before you realize, you know, actually I can get more out of everybody here rather than just being the big fish in a small pond sort of attitude or just trying to kill everybody. Um, I think I think another big thing that I come up against as a as a bit of a struggle for new people as well, and it probably kind of ties into the ego thing that we were talking about before, is just that ability to match intensity or just understand what a lower or an upper belt is giving. It, let's be honest, it's usually upper belts, isn't it? Like you might be a quite relaxed intensity because you're trying to give that lower belt an opportunity to learn and work through something but they're dead adamant on trying to kill you like they want to try and take the scalp of the upper belt to say like look what I did I managed to take size back and uh you know what what's your opinion on that because it some it's sometimes difficult to get over to them that that isn't really the best way to train or um what what they're perceiving as a win isn't actually going to be a win long term yeah like I've had this discussion with quite a few people um, and I do know people that will count taps in the gym and they'll count points in the gym and every round they have to win, they have to win, they have to win. Even if someone comes in at a lower intensity, maybe they've had a long day or they're just wanting to work a specific aspect and they sort of come in being like, okay, I want to work my back defence, so I'm going to allow... Not necessarily allow, but I'm going to be more vulnerable to back takes because that's an aspect of my game that I know I need to improve on. And you'll get some that will come away from that of the win and without fully understanding the full picture of that. And I think with that as well, you get them where the start of the round, I think everyone should start at the same intensity unless there's that sort of unwritten nod and agreement that you're my hard round we're each other's tough round so we tend to go hell for leather in every round that we go for um but uh, yeah like you said i think there needs to be a level of using that first minute of being okay this person's not really matching the intensity that i'm giving them so i'm gonna bring it down a notch and especially with the less experienced players if someone's doing that to you maybe have that respect back where you're going to be like, okay, I can see you're not on that intensity or you're sort of letting certain things go. So I'm going to bring my intensity down so I can work with you rather than just trying to absolutely nail you. Because I know I've been in that position where someone's not matched my intensity, where like where I've been tired or I've been trying to work specific aspects of things and I've gone at a slower pace, but then they've just come in like a bull, like just constantly head first, attacking, attacking, attacking. Not like I don't mind whether you're sort of going a bit hard, like a bit more intense than I am. Just don't try and be two, three, four hundred percent more intense than I'm being. And um, because then when I switch the intensity up, then the the feeling of it's okay isn't reciprocated and you can kind of upset people or put people off but if you're gonna you've I think what I'm trying to say is if you're gonna put the intensity on somebody that's kill or be killed essentially keep that same intensity when you're being matched because it's it's kind of like a bit of a bully mentality otherwise where you're taking advantage of someone's kindness so to speak and then when that sort of kindness isn't so, like isn't there anymore, you've got you shell up a little bit because you can't match the intensity and 
you're not liking how it feels to be on the receiving end of it. So what's your thoughts yeah. on it? So, so here's, here's two scenarios that I'm going to throw at you and then you can talk me through what your opinion on them is and like how you think you best overcome that. So let's say, for example, you're the upper belt and then there's, there's somebody who's like, might have been training 12 months, let's just say, for example, and your intent for that round is that you're going to like kind of, as you say, be a bit kind of allow them to get into certain positions and be pretty relaxed with it and be quite playful. But maybe they, you, you know, they're passing your guard, they've done something good and they pass your guard, but then they start like grinding their forearm into your neck and start applying a lot of head pressure or just like dirty jiu-jitsu, the sort of jiu-jitsu that you do with one of your best mates or in competition. And you like calm, calm down a little bit. You know, it's not a fight. Well, what do you do then if it escalates up or escalates down? What do you think so, of that situation? Yeah, if they start sort of grinding like things into the throat and driving the head into the face and like say the dirty jiu-jitsu stuff, I'll throw a few tricks that I've got up my sleeve back at them. So, like, if someone's in a position where their ribs are near my face and I can feel them being a bit gnarly with things, I will drive my chin into the rib cage. Um, and anyone's experienced that, it doesn't feel the best. And if someone's being a bit gnarly with, like, pressure across the throat from a side control position, I'll match that kind of pressure and push it back and sort of if they look at me a bit I'll be like I can play this way if you want or we can sort of bring it down it's sort of like a bit of an unspoken conversation what I'll have hmm. and if they continue with it then I will snap out of that relaxed mode get back to an advantageous position and get a bit gnarly with them for about 30 seconds and then bring it back down yeah. see how they respond and if they want to continue with the gnarliness then that's fine by me if they sort of read the message and they don't want to continue with that then I'll sort of take it down another notch to let them get back on top and continue to work from there Pr prison, rule, prison rules prison rules jiu-jitsu oh, that's it that's where the wrist locks come out <laughs> no, yeah totally it's just like uh, you know you just a bit of a warning shot like you know we can both play at this game or yeah. we can be nice. Yeah, like, which, which, which one do you want? Because we can do yeah. both, and I'm fine for both. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. And then the other one that I'd throw at you is similar sort of scenario. You're letting somebody get to something, but like you're kind of putting it out there like, does this guy know how to armbar? I'm going to let him see if he knows how to armbar. And you kind of just leave your arm there open. And then you get it, and then in their head, they're like, I've, just, I've got a size arm. All right snap and then you just launch back into it and try and break your arm off in that situation it a conversation is needed um because at no point ever should there be a submission snapped on during training um and it's something that i it's hard to control it 100 percent because like you said excitement emotions can get in the way also, if you're trying to put a submission on quickly, it may happen by accident. Like, um, like I say, we all, we all have it where we slip in training and we've kind of got hold of something. But then it's also knowing that if you're going to do that, be having the experience to be like, let go as you're falling back. Or having that sort of, having your ears ready for if someone does go, yeah, 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 you're letting go straight away. Um, but yeah, I think that's where conversation is sort of needed with the person afterwards and being like, I understand that you might have been a bit excited and you snapped it on, but there's still no need to snap any submission on. Um, yeah, because I think... Um, it's something that I try to encourage at Hive of playing catch and release with submissions, um, but also not doing it every time because then you get out of the habit of actually holding submissions and locking them on. But yeah, try, I do try and encourage that of don't snap submissions on, but in the same light, if it does, just have a word with your training partner 
Um, but yeah, about what, what about yourself in that situation? No, I agree. Like nobody should be snapping submissions on unless it's a self defence scenario. Yeah. Really, to be honest, like we, we all know the intent of all the submissions, whether it's arm bars, whatever, it's to, it's to break a limb, isn't it? And you're not mm. trying to do that to your training partners. And the, the other, the only other thing that I'd add into what you were saying there as well, because I agree with that, it's that there's, there's a fine degree of sensitivity and control for a more experienced player, and there might be some degree of confusion there. I'm absolutely no expert whatsoever but I've got a good degree of sensitivity to where um, joint tightness is and you can accelerate up to that point in the submission, but then it's that final 1% of the submission that's either going to cause an injury or force your opponent to tap where you can stop just before then. But it takes a lot of skill to be able to know what that feels like. And I think for some beginners, there might be a confusion of like, oh, well, I accelerated up to that point, so I'm going to do the same. But the problem is you don't know what that end range is because you've just not got enough practice and on knowing what that feels like. So that might be one thing that I've maybe not necessarily considered before. But still importantly, going back to what you were saying uh, previously, it's just like slowing everything down. And I really like that idea of catch and release as well because if you can control the position, even if, even if it is a submission position without necessarily intending to finish, you could probably get the finish if you oh, wanted yeah. to because it's just one degree extra of movement, isn't it? Mm. So if you can get it up to that 99% point where you're not injuring your partner, but it's an opportunity for you to both work around the situation, like your win is kind of hold this for 20 seconds and their win is, okay, I know he's not going to try and finish me, but this is an opportunity for me to try and work my escapes yeah. and I can get quicker at that escape. So actually we don't end up at this point next time. I think another point for that catch and release as well is it lets you see how the the different ways people try to escape from the submissions that you're playing. And it lets you get your secondary, your third attacks, your fourth attacks, or how to get back to that first attack if your second, third, and fourth, or fifth, however many, doesn't quite work out. But uh, sort of back to the scenarios, I've got one for you here. So, like, you've... You've got somebody who might either visit the gym or a regular trainer partner you've got, and you know they're a gnarly role. Like everything they do is with not malice, but they have to win every single round. Now you're going to roll with them, and you know what you're getting in. You know what you're getting in for, and as soon as you, as soon as you get the sort of that initial contact. You can feel the intensity in it. Like, how would you? Because there's a lot of people that, that are like that in the gyms. How would you address that person if you wanted to maybe bring their intensity down, or is there another way that you'd approach that person? I suppose the the way that I just ask ask another question to to go into more depth of asking it is like, is that person like one of your best mates on the training mats or is that somebody who you would look at as more of like a competitive role um let's get an answer for both yeah right okay so if it's and, and you'll be able to attest to this as well if it's one of your best training partners on the mat and you know you, you you like each other and you're good mates and you've been training together for a while if you if you can't match that intensity for whatever reason and you know that they're trying to go hard, whether that's training for competition or you can just see in the other rounds in the gym that they want a tough match, you're just like, listen, mate, I've got to, I can't, I can't match that. Like, let's just have a bit more of a playful round or work on this specifically. Like, if you want to, you know, if you want a tough round in this position, I can get there, but I can't, I just can't go that hard for whatever reason, whether it be you're injured or you can smell an injuries in the air or something like that. You just want to lower it down because... I don't think just going in and being relaxed is going to bring their intensity down at all. Um, if, if, if it's intent on a hard roll and you usually have a hard roll, just going in and going soft. It's like that whole joke about flow rolling, isn't it? It's like yeah. 10 seconds into flow rolling and somebody's getting tombstoned. <laughs> um, it's just always the way it works. So if, if it's a good mate for me, I'd just say, I, I can't match that intensity tonight, mate. Let's just have a bit more of a flow role or can we work on this particular position or kind of kind of just like bring the intensity of the match down before you step into the round or before the buzzer goes 
But equally, on the other side of that, like let's say it's just me and you were in training, we, without even saying anything, could know whether it's going to be a tough round, like whether we're going to try and kill each other, or whether it's going to be a more playful technical round. Mm. And it's just knowing your training partners more so than anything else, isn't it? Yeah. And kind of that first contact, like that bump of hands and the body posture is pretty much what signifies what sort of round it's going to be. And if it's not the sort of round you want to match to begin with, just tell your training partner, I would say. I think the, the other one with, with more difficulty to answer is if it's somebody who you may be not necessarily quite so friendly with or like mm-hmm. you train with them infrequently, but you, there's a bit of ego there. That's yeah. a more difficult one because you're not going to want to bring that intensity down because it's more of a competitive fight almost. And maybe if you can't match that intensity that you know is about to happen, maybe just... To, uh, squash your ego and just sit out of that round yeah I think that's a very valid point that like I think it's import, more important in that situation to sit it out or just say to them nah not, I, not today like they may pull the face at it and they may have something to say about it but if because every gym's got them whether they're visiting or whether they're a staple of the gym but the kind of role that they've injured a few people, they've got a hundred percent mentality, they've they've not got a first, second, or even a third gear. It's just full tilt, hundred mile an hour down the motorway, still getting and then putting the foot down even more if the cops are behind them. Like with those kind of roles, you kind of got to make sure that you're in the right mindset for it or skilled enough to Keep them at keep them at measure. So, if you know that that person's there and they're like that intense and roll with rolling, but you're of a level where you go, I know I can weather, weather that storm and take something away from it without having to have the conversation or miss one out. Then, use your own educated judgment to take that role. But if if it's of no interest to you and you've got zero interest in having a role of that intensity and you can't have the conversation with them to say to them, can we bring it down a little bit or can we do some situational rounds or can we do some drilling rounds? Just say, no, nah, I'm all right. Cheers, mate. But I'll, we'll get another round another time. So some, some people, and I'm just playing devil's advocate a bit here, some people might take that a bit disrespectfully, especially if it is that sort of a relationship. Well... If they do, then that's that's on them. That's their own pride. That's that's their own issues that they've got to deal that they've got to deal with. Like if they can't be a considerate training partner, then don't give them the time of day to be one of your training partners. If, I'm, if that's being brutally honest, like if they can't respect that, you don't want that intensity of around. Then that's that's theirs to deal with. Yeah, and they're going to have those days as well, aren't they? And it's a, a bit of respect both ways, even if it's something that you consider a bit of a gym adversary or it's always feel, always feels like competition day, you've still got to have respect for that person because ultimately, let's be honest, if they're looking at you as a tough round and they feel like they need to bring their A game, they respect your game enough to know that you're a good player and whether or not there's, like, um, there's a level of respect there, whether, the, whether or not there's a level of friendship there. Yeah. Um, so. Like, it's just respect in both ways. And I think a big, one of the highest risk things in the gym is ego. Um, mm. So just, just being able to control your ego and just, you know, tr- translate as respectfully as possible. It's just like, I can't roll like that today, mate. Or, no, uh, sorry, next time. Or I'm going to sit this one out. But, you know, just making it not that, like, you're just sitting out with them. But then you're going to go full tilt with the next person that you roll with. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's the point as well. Don't be that kind of role as well, where you're going to shy away from the tough ones, but then everybody else who's less experienced than you, you're going to go full tilt and try and smash them. Because then going back to what we were saying before, that's, again, a, a bullied mentality of, I'm going to smash everybody else, but somebody who can actually give me a challenging round and push me mentally and physically, I don't want that round. Like, if that's if that's the reasoning behind you turning that, that tough round down, then I think you need to have a word of yourself and maybe have, have that round in your bag. 
um, especially if you're going to go around and, like you said, smash the, the next round that you're going to have or try and pick a less experienced player to make a statement with. Don't if you're if you're going around and having those intense rounds and then somebody tough comes and grabs you for the next one. Like, don't be that person that turns it down. <laughs> no, I totally, I totally agree with that. I think a good point for me in summary, like looking at all training partners in the gym as well. And and I've heard a couple of people say this, and I, I kind of agree with it from the first point that I heard it. Is you've got in the gym, depending on whatever level that you're at, unless you're right at the bottom of the ladder in terms of training. If you've been there six months, to twelve months, or you've been there ten years, you've got people that are worse than you. You've got people that are the same level as you, as you and you've got people that are better than you. And yeah. you've got to get roles in with each one of them, but know how to use those roles differently. Like it might be a good opportunity for you to train with a lower. Uh, experienced or lower belt training partner and just get the reps in uh, getting used to the the setup of a technique and not necessarily trying to finish it but just try and get 10 you know 10 goes in a round of trying to solidify and lock up a technique without trying to finish it and then mm. just get the mechanics of it down against uh, an unwilling opponent because that's different from drilling because yeah. when you're drilling you know you're just going to get to that position anyway so kind of work out the bugs of it against a lower level training partner who can provide some realistic resistance, then you've got that opportunity to practice it against the high level belts where they might give you some feedback on like why it's not working, what they do differently. And then, you know, you're the, you're the less experienced guy in that scenario. So it's your time to learn. And then you go against the guys that are your training level. And that might be like we've just described going against somebody who's going to be a competitive role. And you can mm -hmm. take the lessons that you've learned from the lower belts and you can take what you've learned from the more experienced players. And then you can actually put it into practice in a really competitive role with somebody who's at your level. No, definitely. Uh, fully agree with that. Like I, I, I was speaking before we started recording that I call this the sort of the tier system. So like learning something completely new, I'm gonna start I'm gonna start learning it with the less experienced players in the rounds. And just as you said, as you get more proficient, you go up that tier system and experience level. Um because like everybody's valuable on the mats. It's like we we've mentioned before with uh Hodger Gracie winning the world championships when his training camp was essentially just white belts. But he was putting himself in bad positions and trying new things and working things with every training partner and making them better whilst he's making himself better as well. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, yeah, a really good quality for everybody on the mat is they've got every, the, 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 the most impressive thing about everybody that comes onto the mat is like creativity and they've got a brain. And even though somebody who's a lower level of experience might not have that full technical aspect of it yet, you can kind of use the technical level that they've got and let them be creative with it because you can never replicate somebody's creativity. You know, just because somebody comes onto the mats and they're not like an expert at jujitsu straight away, you might actually be able to apply that creative thinking from whatever it is that they do as a job or whether they're a musician or something like that. They'll be able to bring some different value to the mat. So yeah, I, to I totally agree that being able to use uh, lower level experience guys who might not be technically as proficient, but kind of tap into their other assets like the tenacity or the uh, creativity and just being able to utilize every skill that they bring to the mat. Because I think everybody's got different skill sets, whether that be from somebody who's 60 kilos provides a different skill or ability to move up to somebody who's like 120 kilos, uh, whether that's male or female training partners, you know, everyone, everyone's got a different value, I guess is what we're trying to say. And not that that value is any less than somebody else's or, more than somebody else's, it's just different. And it's just like people, isn't it? Everyone provides something different, so make the most out of everyone that's available to you. Mm. I think um, another little thing as well, um, and we've both been there as well, where someone's tried to pass knowledge on that wasn't quite right, but sort of what, where do you stand on like passing knowledge on to your training partners? Um, during rounds, after rounds, before rounds, like what's your stance on, on that? So like you said before, with somebody who's very new and needs coaching, like if you're one of the more experienced players on the mat, or maybe you're even the coach for that session, you might be running that session, 
then it, it's your job to make sure that they're doing everything right. I think maybe what you might be alluding to is somebody who's been there maybe a little bit more than 12 months who thinks they know um, more details of, of the technique than they maybe actually do in reality, trying to pass inaccurate information onto somebody who's new. And then the downside to that is that they're going to de develop bad habits off the back of that. Um, and actually, it's not doing you any favours either because you're just reaffirming bad habits yeah. and not actually thinking as that kind of lower to intermediate experienced player like actually what is going on there because when you stop and think about it what what you might be telling is wrong mm. um and a, a training technique that i've used especially with my peers training partners or upper level training partners is like going into the round at the beginning with the idea that this is going to be an educational round so maybe don't have that conversation mid-round but sit back afterwards and have a chat about what, what happened here, what happened there, was this good, how can I improve on that? I, for that scenario, I don't think that that should happen mid-round. I think that's kind of like a post-game breakdown after the fact. So you go into the round with an intention, you do the match hard or, or to whatever intention you've got for the round and then you sit down and you break that down afterwards. Mm. That's my opinion. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. Like, think unless your maybe purple belt or a top like a a seasoned blue belt i think that should be the minimum requirement for passing on sort of like knowledge without cross-referencing with the with the guy who's leading the room that day um like because we all have techniques that we do really well at, at our levels but you may have adapted it to fit your body type specifically. So unless you're fairly seasoned, you're not going to be able to adapt the advice that you're given to fit someone of a different body type. Hmm. So I think cross-referencing what you're saying with your coach or maybe even just someone who's more experienced than you, I think that's important for if you're going to be passing on knowledge to someone who's less experienced than you but um i really like the idea of what you're saying about the educational rounds and like i'll happily answer questions with people after a round that i've had with them um because i'm even though i'm focusing on myself for that round i'll always try and pick up what somebody's done well in that round as well and like because it's happened more and more the more longer i've been a brown belt um of people asking me after rounds where can i improve or what did i do well what did i do wrong and so i'm just constantly analyzing when i'm rolling i think that could be just like since i started coaching as well to give people feedback of where they can improve or if they've not had the best round i'll tell them what they've done good hmm. i'll be like do you know what your pressure was great your even though Pat might have passed your guard, it was a challenge to get past it. Just to give them that positive feedback and let them know that even though you might have felt it didn't go right, here's what you actually did really well. Um, but yeah, I think someone passing on knowledge, unless you're, like I said, in season blue belt and above, I think you should cross-reference what you're saying with your coach first. Um, I think I've got one further on that as well, to be honest, man. Like, even if you are a blue belt or above, um, if somebody asks you a question that you're rolling with, and I, th I think just kind of out of res respect for the coach or, or the class as well, because it might be an issue that everybody's having and it might bring it up mm -hmm. to, the, to the coach at the class to kind of bring everybody back in and go over that point, because it might be a really valid point. Let's say somebody's having a real struggle pulling off a particular detail of an armbar even though you might know how to how to make that correction for your training partner to do it call the coach over and be like oh you know like this guy's got this issue here is it if he does this then he's going to get it yeah and like the coach might go yeah that's right like just do um what i just said there or just do or, or it might not be the case it might be like no that's not quite right what actually has to has to happen is this yeah. And then it might be something that the coach feels is really valuable for everybody to learn. So, like, that might not be something that immediately popped up, but it's like, right, okay, everybody come around. Like, these guys are having this issue. This is what we do to get around it, blah, blah, blah. 
That's a very good point, that actually. Um, yeah, I never, I never looked at it in that way, to be fair. Because, like, if, let's say, if one person's having it, you never know who else in the room might be having that same issue. So I think, it, yeah, it's definitely worth bringing it up and out. And in that same as well, like, if you're someone's trying to do it to you, you can't exactly step back and get an overview of what's going on. So having that third person there while someone's asking for advice is going to give them better advice than you get you there going, okay, now if you bring your leg over this way and then adjust your hips this way and adjust my arm this way, it's you you got a better, much better viewpoint then as well. Yeah. Which is why we've all got coaches. <laughs> <laughs> oh definitely. But um before we sort of wrap up then, have you got any sort of maybe three top tips for everyone to sort of make the most out of their training partners? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of frame it in that tier system that I guess that you were saying before. So my advice to new people, whether that be from day one up to 12 months of being in the gym is go in there, as uh, you said, to relax and have fun, but kind of pick up and be respectful from your training partners and just, just be there to learn, just be open-minded calm your ego down a little bit and just open yourself up to having fun but being relaxed while you're doing it whilst you're learning the skill i think for people who've been training 12 months to two to three years maybe you're in that like upper white belt blue belt getting close to purple belt sort of a range what i was saying before i think is really valuable you can just go back and watch it again if you want to have more of a detail on it but the using the lower belts to practice your technique on using the higher belts to learn some experience from and then putting that into hard practice against your peers and then i'm not there yet but like you know if i was a more experienced player black belt or something like that maybe you're taking it as more of an opportunity to coach and give back from that point of view and um, using the coaching experience and the value that you'll get from that to enhance your game and kind of think about what it's like to be a beginner again and uh, allow that to develop your game because somebody might provide an insight on something that either you've, you know, you've forgotten about or a small detail that actually can expand your knowledge further. As I'm not quite, I'm not at that point yet, but uh, from what I've heard of other black belts or more experienced players, that's generally the attitude. And it's more of a, a, a giving back level and a, and a learning and coaching. No, to, yeah, no, to be honest, mate, they're pretty much the same things that were, that I'd, uh, that I'd advise people. Um, but also just to sort of, like from the conversations we ha- we've had, like you, you're on the money with like that, the ex- higher experience um, level as well. Like, cause even like from when you've taught me through things and uh, from what I've seen with your coaching um, at Flow, the attention to detail that you have to give, even for techniques that you don't use, you have to still understand them. So it, it does better your game the more that you can coach and teach things. And then when you are coaching and teaching, just try and ensure that you're getting those tough rounds as well with the more experienced people or letting yourself be in vulnerable positions against less experienced players so that they can improve their 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 game as well as you're improving your defence. So if you are the type like so to speak the best in the room or the best on the map doesn't mean that you have to win every round like you can allow yourself to be put in side control or be mounted or have your back taken to get out of dangerous situations or even just start from that position as well like I've died it in rounds where I've been like okay I want to work with back defense jump on I want to start the round here and we'll play from there yeah, and I think actually just thinking about it now with the thought rolling off our tongue is just like maybe when you start off, you know, you could look at Jiu-Jitsu like an hourglass or like a like a funnel almost where when you're at the beginning of Jiu-Jitsu, there's so many broad techniques that you've kind of got to learn from. And then as you get more experience, maybe that comes down to like a singular point of a small handful of techniques when you're at like blue and purple belt that you really get some good mastery of. Mm-hmm. And then you take that mastery as you go out into being more experienced and then that knowledge and uh, ability to translate knowledge from what you know really well out spreads out back into those big techniques that white belts need to learn again. So I don't, I don't know what you think about that concept or idea, but I'm just thinking about it now off the top of my head. 
No, no, that's um, pretty much that's it. Because like they say, like they say, when you get your black belt, you're essentially starting again. Um, especially competitively, like the depth of talent in the black belt division is you're almost starting like a white belt again when you get to your black belt. So no, it's that makes a lot of sense. And then to further on that, the sand going through the middle is like your knowledge trickling down to the people below. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching another episode of the Grappers Academy. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to hit the like button and also hit that subscribe button. And if there's anybody out there that you think could benefit from anything that we talked about today, don't forget to share the video and pass that information on.